Uh, okay, so in Tanzania, we have a settlement that says that if in your house you don't visit, even you don't get visitors, mm -hmm. you have to ask yourself, what's the problem of my house? <laughs> <laughs> so for the Alliance House, we have a guest today who will give us the seminar. And our guest is called Dr. Tom. He is the president and chief counselor Chief Executive Counselor of U.S. Grain Council, a, a non-profit organization that promotes the global use of U.S. barley, corn, and sorghum, and related for products including ethanol and dry grains with its soluble. Uh, he has different projects in several parts of the world in different countries, like for example, South Africa, Tanzania, Nigeria, and for example, and of course, Mexico, among other countries. So I think his expertise and his knowledge that he has, it will be a great, it will be a powerful tool for us and for our campaign. So we, you can join me with a great applause to join Dr. Tobu <laughs> All right, Gabriel, mucho gusto. Isabella, Harbutena. Hello. Uh, nice to be here. My name is Tom Slade. I work for the U.S. Grants Council, Washington, D.C., uh, kind of the center of the universe for all the people that uh, live there, I think. So, um. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about, you know, Sarah asked me to talk about something that you have been looking at, the world has been watching, that is this crazy presidential election that we're in the middle of. What's the effect on agricultural trade? Just I want to introduce myself just a little bit. I grew up on a farm in, in, uh, in New York, uh, actually in the Poughkeepsie area, not too far from here, about four hours' drive from here. I went to school here at Cornell. This is a very, uh, you know, this place has a very warm place in my heart, and I'm always glad to come back here, particularly talking about something that, as dear as, as agricultural trade. Um, I work for the U.S. Grains Council, and again, as, as in the introduction, we work to develop markets for U.S. maize, barley, and sorghum all around the world. We have offices and consultants that work around the world, many of them in the countries that you are from. Uh, and so, with the exception of, of New Zealand, we've neglected that for some reason, I don't know why. But <laughs> anyway, uh, we work a lot of agricultural development projects where we try to work with agricultural uh, industries in resident countries to help improve agricultural production, improve uh, efficiencies, and, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the long run, that actually will improve trade. The thing that we, uh, you know, is very important to us um, as kind of a motto is that when trade works, the world wins. Uh, it goes back to my, some of the first classes I took here about Cornell and looking at comparative advantages, comparative economic advantages around the world. And trade is, is very important to the world. It's very important to U.S. agriculture for sure because uh, only 95.7% uh, of the world's population, they updated that figure just a little while ago, lives outside the borders of the United States. And one of the things that U.S. agriculture always has to be concerned about is its presence with world trade. U.S. agriculture needs world trade because markets here in the United States are relatively stable. They're not growing uh, tremendously. They're diversifying tremendously, but they're not growing tremendously. The demand in the rest of the world is where you see the growth in demand. And um, I work for an organization that's supported by farmers across the United States. It's a, it's a public-private partnership. Uh, we also work with the Foreign Agricultural Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This is at the core of what we believe. When trade works, the world wins. And so, you know, we, we talk a lot about what's going on with trade, attitudes towards trade. And this is kind of, I want to start here with uh, farmers. I, I, I surveyed our farmers a while back, uh, actually it was about uh, a year or so ago, and asked them, trade is important to U.S. agriculture, right? I just said that. So I asked them if they can explain the difference and the importance between TPA, this is the uh, Trade Promotion Authority given to the President of the United States, uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TTIP, uh, the Tr Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, and WTO, the World Trade Organization, can you explain those, the differences between them and the importance of that to your neighbor? Again, farmers, I've always maintained, are some, are one of the most global of any agri, any, any business person, really, in, in the world. 
and they don't even know it, particularly in the United States. So I asked them, you know, I, you know, I just polled them, can they, can they explain the differences? And this kind of shows you, 42% said yes, they could, they are, they're up to speed, they know that the importance of trade. 12% uh, said not in a million years, I could never explain that. Uh, they're being very honest. 34% said my neighbor doesn't care about uh, these kinds of trade agreements. You know, this is kind of something uh, that concerns us. And 12% I'd sooner discuss astrophysics with my dog. In other words, that, you know, the, the, the trade is such an amorphous, it's not in their everyday world topic, yet it's so important to how their, their businesses and their businesses on a daily, on a daily basis. So that kind of, you know, that's kind of the starting point that we know that trade, the dialogue on trade in U.S. agriculture needs to be heightened. Okay, so uh, we'll get back, back to the main event here. Um, back in the spring, a lot of people were asking me, you know, do you really worry about uh, this negative d discussion on trade that's going on with the two presidential candidates? Uh, obviously, we're waiting for, for next Tuesday. We're waiting to get next Tuesday bat past us, actually, more than anything else. But I was asked last spring if we were really worried about this as an organization. You know, not, not so, lots of negative talk about trade. The conventional wisdom in Washington, D.C. was, we've been through this before. We've seen this type of thing happen before where trade becomes uh, kind of a negative topic in elections. And what happens is that, you know, the conventional wisdom was, just wait. Once the election's passed, this will die down. You know, rational discussion and intelligent discussion will take place after the election. And everybody knows that the U.S. in particular is a country that's dependent on trade. That's actually a country that was happily founded on trade. And so that, you know, just calm down, don't worry about it, let them do their thing. Well, then the summer came. And, you know, candidates would say something like this, like TPP is a rape of our country. This is uh, Mr. Trump, obviously. Some of you may have seen him on TV. I don't know. If you haven't, <laughs> I wish I were living where you were. Uh, <laughs> but interesting, he gave this speech, and this is in, actually in Pennsylvania, he gave this speech in front of all these recycled uh, cubes of recycled um, uh, aluminum and metal that actually was being, that, that'll be exported. It's a very big business for New York uh, in, in particular to, to export recycled uh, materials to, to other countries. They pro reprocess them and off we go. And so he said things like that. And it's not just, uh, you know, uh, isolated to uh, Mr. Trump. Um, Secretary Clinton, you know, what got out and she the politically it was very hard for her to be pro-trade. And uh, she came out this summer and said, I've absorbed new information and changed my mind to oppose the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. She was very instrumental earlier on in the creation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but politically, it was a very untenable position to be standing upon as we go into the election. And so she changed her uh, views on this. Um, and even, even in places like there was a campaign, it really got bad, there was a, I don't know if you ever saw this, there was a concert, uh, you know, uh, thing this summer, uh, Rock Against the TPP. I don't know these people, but, uh, well, you know, know this, she's a television actress, and I, I want to make sure I get the uh, name right, Justin Sane of Anti-Flag and Johnny Five of the Flowbots. You, you know these people? No, okay. Uh, <laughs> a very, you know, they're popular. They had a, you know, a, you know, a concert tour Rock Against the TPP that actually was sponsored by um, organized labor. The, the, the concert itself was organized by organized labor. So, wow, I mean, things are getting crazy. Um, and so, this is just, I just read this this morning. I put it in there. This is a comment by, uh, let's see here, Larry Cohen. He is a labor leader. He's part of, um, you know, Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, campaign. And he said just today, it will be absurd if the president-elect and leader of this party, the titular leader, right at the moment, isn't aligning with Democrats with her position. Our expectation, our hope, our encouragement will be that she either help prevent a vote or stop it. This is, again, talking about TPP. The pressure is really aligning for Secretary Clinton, if she is elected, to maintain her anti-trade status. Well, I'll go back a little bit, you know, uh, one of the per people we work with very closely, Clayton Yider, he's one of the, I think he's the only person, I won't say, I say that with uh, a little bit of reservation because you hate saying absolute to comments, but I think he's the only person ever to serve as U.S. Uh, Secretary of Agriculture 
and as the U.S. Trade Representative. And you know, as as the rhetoric started to unfold this summer, you know, he talks about you know how uh, how troubling it is. You know, it's really troubling to me. I think it's shameful. It's coming from both sides. There's a lot of loose language, and unfortunately, it's getting worse instead of better. At least in the last few days, I think it's just shameful. You know, shameful that we have leaders, you know, talking about trade in the way that was happening. Uh, Vice President Candidate Pence came out with this, this, this uh, comment a while ago. Um, regards to other trade agreements, we talked about, I really do believe when American people elect one of the best negotiators in the world as President of the United States, we would, would do well to rene renegotiate individually with countries. You know, coming in my perspective, that's really, you know, tough language. And it's hard to see that because well, we have the NAFTA agreement, and I think for, agri for U.S. agriculture, NAFTA has been a real winner. I think for Mexican ag agriculture, NAFTA has been a real winner. We'll have a graph on that later, and to, to start to tear these agreements up and start renegotiating them bilaterally, country to country, to me is a really, really, really challenging move to make, and it's really troubling to see this because I think we need to move beyond that as the country. You know, the Japanese view, uh, this was made by the uh, DCM, the Deputy Chief of Mission in the embassy, Japanese Embassy in uh, J uh, Washington, D.C. And Prime Minister Abe is working to get the Japanese diet to ratify this deal this fall. If that happens, Tokyo will likely become further entrenched in its views that TPP should remain untouched. You know, it's very important. I think actually uh, they're going to be, um, Japanese are going to vote on TPP before the end of the year. Again, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the U.S. to look at a vote on the TPP, you know, sometime this year as well. Uh, you know, again, Yider talks about this at all. You know, we can talk about this. We, we, sh we have a lot of trade agreements in the world. We ought to honor them all. And if we start talking about tearing them up, that's just nonsense if that were really to happen. And the last comment is really important. I worry about the carnage it would set to affect my kids and my great-grandkids. I'm appalled by the loose language that's being thrown around today. Yeah, loose language, you know, talking about tearing up trade agreements, talking about, you know, removing ourselves from the, from the uh, dialogue, global dialogue on trade, uh, is something that, you know, just every week it was getting worse and worse and worse going up to today. And the Department of T Commerce, you know, has come out very strongly against this. Uh, for both parties, turning away from trade is not just a threat to the econo economy and millions of Americans' livelihoods. It's a threat to our national security as well. Trade is how we lead in a dangerous and uncertain global environment. Trade leadership helps us negotiate agreements that strengthen ties with global partners while protecting the interests of citizens. Expanding trade is key to our country and people more prosperous, making our more prosperous and more secure. Let's build bridges, not walls. This is, you know, here again, people talking about the need to, to build upon our trade stance as a country, as the United States, not tear it down. Um, and build bridges. This is kind of an example of what they're talking about, you know, in terms of, this is uh, from the United Nations Millennial Goal Development Project report in 2015. I know we talk about, you know, people, you know, living in extreme poverty. It's a very important issue for us globally. It's a very important issue for the United States agriculture to be involved in. And, but again, the figures coming out from the United States, you know, trade is helping lower that, uh, that, that extreme poverty uh, you know, level in across the world. It's something that's very, very important that we continue to look at that having better connections between countries, opening up trade, looking at comparative advantage, it helps lift, you know, ships around the world. Right, I'm gonna, this is kind of where we're at as of right now today, where both the candidates are in terms of trade. Um, Hillary Clinton has supported trade liberalization throughout her career and has opposed certain trade agreements uh, to protect workers. You know, she has been very key in defending workers' rights in trade agreements and environmental rights in trade agreements, but she has supported trade liberalization. Uh, Mr. Trump has never met a trade pact he likes and prom promised to impose new tariffs to protect American workers. For us, you know, in the agricultural trade arena, this is a giant step backward if we start doing that because the, you know, the, the unintended consequences of that are, are severe. Uh, uh, Secretary Clinton opposes TPP, once called it the gold standard. Trans-Pacific Partnership was created to be, you know, a 21st century trade agreement that goes well beyond, 
you know, former trade agreements and sets the standard for future trade agreements. She was once a part of that. And of course, uh, you know, Mr. Trump says he would withdraw from the TPP and appoint smart negotiators. Well, I work with a lot of these negotiators already, and they're pretty smart. Uh, and I, I think if, I don't know where they're going to find much smarter people than that um, in, in terms of how these agreements have come to place. It's been a very broad international global dialogue uh, on the TPP, and I've been a part of a lot of those, those, those conferences. And there's, again, it's exciting to see this type of cooperation and tackling tough issues. Um, Mrs. Clinton, uh, you know, supports NAFTA, may consider some improvements. Uh, anything can be improved. We all recognize that. I think that's, that's not such a bad stance. It doesn't trouble us at all. Uh, Mr. Trump would tell partners that the U.S. intends to renegotiate NAFTA. Really, for agriculture, it's a troubling thing to talk about that because, yeah, NAFTA has been very important. Actually, there are a lot of elements of TPP that sort of improve on NAFTA in many respects, particularly uh, in, in between you know, Canadian uh, and U.S. trade and, and, of course, Mexican trade. But re renegotiating of NAFTA from tearing it up and starting over again is something that that's not, not very productive. Um, Secretary Clinton once opposed uh, CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, supported agreements with Singapore, Chile, and Oman. Uh, you know, Mr. Trump would label China a currency manipulator and instruct the U.S. Trade Representative's Office to bring a cases against China. This is, uh, again, a, a ton of a topic, uh, one of the, <laughs> you know, be careful who, you know, the pot calling the kettle black, as we say here in the United States, because you could say the United States is, 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 can manipulates currency uh, in terms of to help its outlook on trade. You know, that's something that we've been accused of, too, so be careful how you, how you throw that around. Um, Secretary Clinton's talking about having a trade prosecutor. A big thing within Washington right now is enforcement of trade agreements. That's a very key issue in Washington right now. Uh, and so you see there have been some moves yet this past summer and fall to have a much broader profile on enforcing current trade agreements. That's something that's happening right now. She wants to actually have a trade prosecutor. Not such a bad idea, I don't think. Um, so along the same lines, Mr. Trump would have created an American desk under the Commerce Department, which is kind of, we're not really sure exactly what that means, but I think it means, you know, putting American first in terms of enforcement of trade agreements. Uh, and, but that's just not the way the world operates, at least that, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, one of the more revealing things uh, in, for Secretary Clinton, there's nothing about trade on her website. Uh, she's staying away from this issue. It's a little bit toxic for her. Uh, it's difficult for her. Uh, and so we're going to see what happens uh, in the weeks to come, or next week and then beyond that. This is sort of a, a graph that shows, uh, you know, the benefits uh, we see, you know, where, where you've had different trade agreements for U.S. agriculture. Here's a big bump in trade, the value of trade uh, after NAFTA. Uh, and it also shows, you know, U.S. imports in the gold line and U.S. exports in this darker line. Every trade agreement for U.S. agriculture has been a winner, and it's also been a winner for our partners in these trade agreements as they've gained better access to the U.S. marketplace. And so, uh, you know, that's numbers, speaking about trade and the importance of trade uh, as, a, as a country. So, you know, what do we do about this? <laughs> how, do we, how do we talk about this, uh, you know, in this kind of toxic environment we are right now? What we've talked about it for, for farmers is to talk about the value of trade in bringing countries closer together, in tearing down walls. And I, I, I can sh share this with you from my own personal experience. Uh, as I, I, These next examples are, I directly experienced these things. Um, when I first started in my career working for the U.S. Grades Council back in 1983, I want to ask how many people were, were born in 1983. That would really be tough. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't do that anymore. But in 1983, I started working for the U.S. Grades Council. One of the first projects we did was a, a a feed mill project, a pilot feed mill project in Nanjing, China. It was when you had the ping pong diplomacy between the Nixon administration and China where we started to exchange, you know, ping pong players, you know, the you know, open door policy started to expand and we started to look for areas where we could actively cooperate as countries. And, and the agriculture and particularly feed for our particular uh, interests was a big area of interest because, you know, modern feed production to help feed, you know, a growing population and growing needs uh, for uh, greater food and more food, particularly on the meat side. 
So we had this, this project, and the, the, those exchanges between our two countries clearly brought us together, clearly brought us closer together as countries, and e even stands to today. Um, I worked a lot earlier in my career, I worked in the, uh, uh, everything behind the Iron Curtain. I was working in the East Germany, and every year, twice a year, we would go to the Leipzig International Trade Fair. It's been going on since for 700 years uh, in Leipzig, at that time, East Germany. So we would go there and uh, we talked about, you know, the wall. I'm sure only a couple of you may remember this particular TV show. It was called Dynasty. It was all about very rich people, you know, fighting with each other. It was one of the few shows that was uh, actively transmitted into uh, East Germany. If you had to write, write television antenna, you could see this show. It was translated in German. What it did is it started to give, let people know on the east side you know, some of the things, how the rest of the world starts is, now, you know, this is obviously fiction, but it showed them, you know, the fancy cars and all this kind of fun stuff. It started a discussion, you know, started a communication, albeit, you know, a little bit awkward. And um, eventually, you know, it led to, uh, and I, I will say this because I was there at the time, it led to the wall, the Berlin Wall, coming down. Because communication, you know, what are we missing out on? Uh, how is our system not serving the needs of our country? It happened. I was there, you know, <laughs> and I got a piece of, of the wall right, right on the east side. It was pretty, pretty cool. I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime, but it happened. Uh, in the USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, right? Again, another archaic phase that shows you how old I am. But uh, I was working uh, a little bit south of Chernobyl. This is the Chernobyl nuclear accident that happened uh, in, um, in the Ukraine. Uh, and I was working about maybe 30, 40 miles south of this when the accident happened. Uh, I, about two or three days was before I got to go back home. I was living in Vienna, Austria at the time. I got into the cab and, and going back to my home. I said, where were you? I was just in the USSR. I was outside of Kiev. I said, Kiev, what about the accident? I said, what accident? I had no idea. I had no idea, you know, again, about three days in, the, in, in Moscow after that. No idea that this happened, but a lot of people feel because that news of that was picked up internationally before it was talked about in the USSR, that that actually was one of the key events in you know, dismantling the Soviet Union uh, and, and uh, the, you know, that regime. And I, I, you know, I was part of that. You could see where communication brought down those, those borders, those, the conflict between the countries. And it got to a, to a better state on trade, and actually USSR became a very good trading partner at that time for U.S. agriculture. Later in my career, I was working in Vietnam, uh, and the key thing about uh, Vietnam was the fact that they were starting to look around and seeing what was happening all around them in terms of communication, all the other Asian tiger economies, Japan, Korea, you know, other places in Southeast Asia, were advancing you know, very aggressively. And they felt that they were being 70 years behind the times. And so, you know, we, while, while you know, things are still relatively the same government-wise, their attitude towards the rest of the world changed immensely at that time. This is about uh, in the kind of the mid-90s when this happened. They, they started to actively look out, have better communication with the rest of the world on trade. And now Vietnam is, the, it, for our particular purposes, it's the fastest growing feed market in the world right now, their, their agriculture is growing very aggressively, and there's a lot of, you know, back and forth between our countries on trade. You know, Vietnam is part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it's, and it's one of the key countries where the U.S. actually can, can uh, gain, see some market uh, growth because of the, uh, you know, this aggressive growth that's going on in the feed industry. So Cuba, another example, uh, <laughs> that's in their headlines a lot lately. Uh, same sort of thing, you know, a lot of information kind of seeps down there from the United States. It, it, you know, people are sort of realizing that uh, uh, their, their, their economy is being constrained. They, they need to, 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 they want to live better, uh, work better, uh, more, more openly uh, relations with the United States. And that led to a thawing of the relationships between the United States and Cuba, particularly on agricultural trade and medical supplies that helped, you know, again, Cuba grow as a country, grow as an economy, uh, and that right now it's poised to be, uh, right now if we had 
the embargo totally uh, removed, Cuba would be the 10th largest uh, export market for U.S. Uh, agricultural products right now. Now, you know, I think maybe in another year or two you might see that and embargo will be totally lifted. It's, it's pretty much lifted now, but uh, moving for us, it's moving, you know, in a, in a better direction. Same sort of thing, Iran, Myanmar, uh, we're having those discussions on trade with those countries. Uh, we met a while back with officials from the Iranian Poultry Federation. They want to have better, more solid communications, particularly on trade issues, particularly on technology issues, particularly on agricultural issues. Uh, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, you know, still a lot of ways to go. Myanmar, the same, same issue. Like Myanmar was a very isolated country. Uh, they realized that their economy was being stifled. The point of all of this is that you know, trade really is helping us move along as, as, a, as, a, as a world, as a planet. And that's where this, this discussion on trade at, at the political level gets so frustrating because those of us that are working in this environment day in and day out see these advantages, see these, these, these positives for both uh, countries around the world and the United States that we hate to see this negative attitude on trade. And so we try to get our you know, farmers you know, that, that I work for to look forward, to look more uh, enhancing about where we are going as a country. Um, this, just about a month or so ago, I, I had the opportunity uh, to go down to see the new lock uh, in the Panama Canal. They built a, a second lock uh, for the Panama Canal to take bigger ships. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very important to Panama as a country. It was really an impressive uh, uh, celebration. But I, I took this picture, not only because it's, you know, it's symbolic for me in many different ways, but it sort of talks about trade and how, how it's important to the whole world. This is a, a ship from China, a container ship from China. It was the first one to go through the new lock of the Panama Canal. Huge. It's a huge uh, ship. Uh, it's about three times the, the, the size of a ship that could go through the other canals. Um, and this is probably bringing all of, uh, you know, Christmas decorations to people around Ithaca that like to put up those big, you know, blow up ornaments, things like that. I'm joking, but it's not so much the picture of that. Okay, so trade is happening. You have this big ship going through the Panama Canal, bringing goods, you know, exchanging goods around the world. The thing that really impressed me is you look at that picture of the crowd, you probably can't see it all that well, but they're all holding up iPhones or smartphones of some sort or other. And to me, this is, embodies trade. But that, that trade has enabled people to exchange the technology, exchange these sort of goods. And it's ubiqu you, uh, smartphones are ubiquitous out throughout the world. I mean, what would you do if somebody said you couldn't have your smartphone taken away from you? I mean, people would go nuts. They really would go nuts. So I just really, it, it struck me sitting there that you have, you know, a ubiquitous technology of, of, of an iPhone that's facilitated by trade between countries happening there in Panama. Panama, obviously, a country that is very much dedicated to trade as part of their whole uh, fabric because of the Panama Canal and what that does. So we have to talk about this. And the other thing that, I, that we work a lot about is, you know, food security, meeting world's food demands. Everybody says we need X number of, uh, you know, food production, you know, X times, you know, number of food production, agricultural production to meet, you know, world food demands by 2050 or so. The one thing that's really, uh, that we see is that there's a 60% increase in the demand for um, protein. You know, affordable meat, milk, and eggs and other protein sources, that's what's really going to be the important part of how trade, you know, expands because, you know, as per capita incomes rise around the world, people change their diets, they eat more protein. This is what's going to be driving, you know, global agriculture for the next uh, couple of decades is this immense new demand for protein. And how are we going to, to uh, satisfy that demand if we don't have, you know, free and open trade? So I developed some one-liners on trade uh, because that's what basically what presidential uh, campaigns boil down to. Um, this is something that we try to talk to our farmers when you're talking to your neighbor. Start talking about this. So you start talking to your congressional representatives about this. We start, you know, having a, a broader, more productive outlook on trade. Okay, so again, the basic one-liner is the flow of goods, ideas, capital, and people is essential for prosperity. This is a principle called collective intelligence that the world has progressed throughout, you know, throughout the time, throughout human history, 
by collecting intelligence to move forward on uh, you know, the flow of goods, idea, and capital. It, it's, prosperity depends on collective intelligence. Try that one. Uh, an example of this, a lot of people wouldn't, you know, don't, wouldn't think I'd start talking about Pokemon Go. Uh, anybody Pokemon Go fans here? All right. Well, I've got to get my notes right in this one. <laughs> Pokemon Go is, a, is an example of this collective intelligence. It's a, it's a, it's a joint venture between um, uh, a Google, hang on, I've got to get this right, between Nintendo and Niantic, a company called Niantic. This is a spin-off from Google. So you have a Japanese game make, maker, you have a, a, a you know, intelligence or a data uh, company spinning off from Google to, called Niantic. They're the ones that invented Pokemon Go. It became a global phenomenon. It was a collective intelligence of these two companies you know, using their, their expertise. And it, this has improved all of our lives, you know, right? Oh, you wouldn't agree, right? Yeah, you, you, you know who that is, right? Jiggle, jigglypuff? <laughs> anyway, uh, I said this one before, uh, 95 point, um, 90, yeah, hang on, 95.7% of the world's population lives outside the borders of the United States. A lot of people in the United States don't realize that, how small a percentage of the world population is represented by the United States. If you're a producer, of food and agricultural products, you want to be producing for the market. And the market right now is, is, out, is outside their borders. And that number changes every day into the advantage of, you know, that number is going to be lower uh, every single second that we, that we go on here. The, you don't see this quite this well, uh, but you can see it's kind of a bad, uh, you know, copy here. But there are more people living inside th this circle which includes India, China, you know, Japan, Southeast Asia, then live outside of it. More people live inside of that circle than live outside of it. And so that, you know, that's something that I think as a, as a globe we have to be concerned about, and especially in terms of trade because, again, uh, you know, people sort of dominate uh, markets as we know. So that's something to hold true. Let me do it on time here, I guess okay. Um, and this is more of a U.S.-centric uh, argument, but it's very important to U.S. farmers that agriculture is a U.S. foreign trade champion. In the United States, agriculture is a positive contributor to our balance in trade. That's something that's very important to us as a country. Uh, we've had a positive balance for quite some time now, albeit the balance is narrowing a little bit because, again, uh, other products, consumer-oriented products, processed products, U.S. is a great market for that stuff. And, uh, but we still, on the balance, Trade works for the United States agriculture, and we should, as, as the United States agricultural system, be championing foreign trade. Falling forward, uh, failing to move forward, means falling behind. Uh, this is uh, something that we're very obsessed about in terms of starting all over again on bilateral trade, trade agreements. Uh, U.S. right now is way behind on, on, on trade agreements in general. Uh, we only have, I think, 26 of them. Uh, in place, and I think you know, globally there's over 250 some uh, trade agreements around the world. Uh, we're failing to move forward means falling further behind, and as a country, the U.S. can't afford to do that. You know, and you know that's what I'm I'm paid to do is to look after our <laughs> what's going on with U.S. trade. This is what came out earlier in the earlier comment. I feel feel strongly about that building bridges, not walls. It's something that we have to be uh, devoted to as a country. That you're not hearing that in the presidential election. When trade works, the world wins. Uh, something that everybody that works for the U.S. Grains Council around the world, from the accountant in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia, to our top trade policy people in Washington, D.C., we all believe this, that when trade works, the world wins. Uh, something that is core to us. Now, I don't know, let's see, how much time we have? We have about another 20 minutes? Okay. Let me try this. Is this going to work? Hang on. Where'd it go now? I'm going to show you something that I have always found kind of interesting. And where'd he go? There he is. Um, this is a video. Uh, I'm just going to play this about, about five or so minutes long. 
We can't turn these lights off, can we? Or? famous demographer from Sweden. And down here, an access for wealth, income per person, $400,000, and $40,000. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! <laughs> and now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. <coughs> 1948 was a great year. The war was over. Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. <laughs> between the countries of the world was wider than ever. The United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence, and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. <laughs> and yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you just seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's, this is something, uh, this is a video we stopped, stumbled upon a few years ago that whenever we talk to people in the United States, we've shown this video about a million times. This is what it's all about for us. His name is Hans, H-A-N-S, Rosling, R-O-S, 
L-I-N-G. Google him and you can watch this, uh, this video again. I've watched it. Every time I watch it, I learn something new. Just tremendous. But this is what's happening in the world. It's, you know, there's global economic growth. There's global improvement in per capita income. There is uh, broad-based uh, development going on, uh, to raising populations up. This is important for the U.S. agriculture to be cognizant of this. This is our market of the future, but it's also our world of the future. It's something that we feel very strongly in, that we have to be talking positively about trade to be, to be a part of this and support this development in any way we can as U.S. agriculture. And I'll, I'll stop there and, and open it up for, for questions. Uh, I know I've thrown a lot at you, and yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> Right. So I really love to get your expertise on the build around. Uh -huh. And what are the, the current um, views on the build arounds? How would key elections affect them? Do you think they're going to end? And one of the subjects of the build around is agriculture. Yeah. And I think it's the 20th of the, of the agriculture agreement. So, how, what's your opinion on that? <laughs> Great question. Um, you know, the World Trade Agreement used to be called the GATT, right? We thought it meant the general agreement to talk and talk, but actually there's a lot of frustration revolving around the WTO, and particularly the Doha round. Um, for our particular interest, the World Trade Organization is extremely important to us as an exporting country, as the United States. Ag U.S. agriculture, WTO, creates the foundation for trade. And if we can't you know, get these uh, trade agreements knocked out there, what are we, what, what's the alternative? We don't see an alternative. There's a lot of frustration going on right now in terms of the agenda, the slow moving Doha around. You know, people say, put a fork on it, it's dead, let's start over again. We're not, we're not one of them. We're not one of them. We say we have to engage, and you know, US agriculture, just like every other country, needs to engage on that forum to talk about these things because we're making progress. And right now with, with the WTO, it's kind of splintering, you know, against a little bit between developed and developing countries, the BRICS versus everybody else. You know, before I think that the WTO has not changed adequately because it used to be the US and the EU would create all the rules in the WTO and that would be about the end of it. As long as the US and the EU could, could agree, everything would move forward. Well, it's not like that anymore. And we know that, and it's good it's not like that anymore. But we have to you know, engage, engage very forcefully with the WTO. And, and right now, uh, the US has a very uh, excellent ambassador to the World Trade Organization. Uh, his name is Michael Punk. I don't know if you're, you'll pay attention to that name. And I think in US politics, you'll hear more about him. He actually, did anybody see the movie, The Revenant? He wrote the, the book that that movie was based on. He's a very talented guy. But he's also a very, very forceful proponent of U.S. engagement in the WTO, it gets really, really cluttered right now by a lot of people, you know, bad mouthing it. We believe very strongly in the WTO. We're doing all we can to support U.S. engagement in there. And a lot, a lot. Of, you know, yes, sir. Um, when you are applying the slide showing the policy plans of both Hillary and Trump, yeah. of course, we've all heard Donald Trump put out a lot of tough talk. Um, yeah. Virtually everyone you speak to has a concern with the kind of policies that he's preaching. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you wonder where he's getting support from because he keeps going. That's you know, an interesting mm -hmm. debate. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, here in the United States, it's nothing like North Korea. It's nothing like... Uh, a country where there's dictatorship. We have Congress, we have the House of Senate, right. which are supposed to serve as checks on the executive branch. Yeah. With all of these policies that he's planning to put through, tear down trade pacts and all of that, and, and people being apprehensive about it and all of that, um, is there any way, for example, that if he wins, Congress could play a role in checking him when it comes to some of those, or the fears that if he really wins, then he may really succeed in tearing down these pacts is, 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 you know, is something that can happen. Yeah, that's a really super question. It's something we've been asking ourselves a lot. Uh, a lot depends on what happens with the U.S. Senate. Uh, if it turns Democrat or, if, you know, it's close to returning uh, 
Democrat. It could. Um, most people think it's going to be a 50-50 uh, split in the U.S. Senate between the two parties, uh, which would, you know, if you know, Secretary Clinton is, was, is elected, that would enable the Senate to be an effective counterbalance because there would be a, a, you know, a majority vote there. If, if Mr. Trump is elected, a lot of people are talking about this in Washington, particularly that he'll bring on really good people, and really good people will, will see, will, ha will have intelligent solutions. That's the only thing right now we can hold on to is that actually is true. Uh, what's happening in, in right now is that there's a lot of people, I don't know if you heard the term coming home in the Republican Party, is that a lot of re conventional Republicans are coming home to the Republican Party right now uh, and in agriculture, there's a lot of very prominent uh, uh, names that are, you know, re well-respected people within U.S. agriculture, uh, not at all, you know, polarizing people. So there is hope that those people could, you know, play a big role in the administration, and we might get back to, um, you know, kind of a recognition. I think, you know, Mr. Trump is a businessman. He knows that trade is important. He has made some positive uh, comments about trade in recent uh, weeks uh, in terms of business, you know. Uh, so that's the hope right now, that there would be qualified people in the administration, that there would possibly be, uh, you know, a democratically controlled Senate that would be a check and balance. Um, if you want a, you know, ray of sunshine, there's a ray of hope to hang on to. But that's why so this election is so incredibly important uh, for the United States as a whole. Yes, sir? I look forward to seeing you next time, jumping around a little bit more. <laughs> uh, what I was struck by Tom Bowen's seriousness was uh, the disconnect between what is going on in agriculture in yeah. terms of exports and you know the, the group that, that uh, our friend is uh, Trump is, is yeah. connecting with, yeah. which is next, you know the, the deplorables. The, uh, yeah. the, uh, the middle-aged white men, for example, who have lost all the manufacturing jobs. Yeah. And, and that's the group that doesn't even understand, I suspect, the agriculture aspect of this. They're more interested in their day-to-day -day jobs. So right. they're not interested in the fact that world poverty <coughs> has declined. Uh, so that disconnect is still very real. And yeah. I don't know what the solution is. Do you? Sure, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll turn to Ohio. Very, it's a battleground state, as they call it now. Ohio is a very key state, big agricultural state. They are at each other's throats in, in, in Ohio between the deplorables, the folks that have been disenfranchised, they've lost their jobs, whatever, um, and agriculture. That's, you know, they, they're, they're actually yelling at each other, saying, we need to have good views on trade. The thing that is missing in all of this is that trade has not lost jobs for U.S. economy. It has displaced jobs. People have had to retrain themselves. Technology has cost far more jobs than trade, uh, infinitely more jobs than trade. In fact, you know, we see trade as a, as a job builder in terms of you know, uh, people are involved in trade you know, in terms of production, in terms of marketing, in terms of transportation, whatever. The dialogue in, in places like Ohio has to be, well, look, you know, technology has, has rob your jobs, not trade. We as a state need trade because we're dependent on it. And so that's the type of discussion that's happening, albeit at a very well, slow pace. The discussion isn't really happening, right? It's happening at the because grassroots. The, because the polarization yeah. is so extreme yeah. that everybody's talking past each other. Yeah. Well, that's a real problem to have as a country because you, know, you can't get elected if you're in the middle. You cannot get elected in the United States if you're in the middle. You have to go to one or the other to get elected because the biggest threat to you as politicians right now is not the general election, it's their primary elections. Uh, you, know, back, I, you know, my congressman back in Virginia, you may, may remember him, um, Eric uh, Cantor, very, very, uh, very conservative uh, congressman. He was beaten at, a, at his primary by someone even more conservative. And so he, and he didn't see it coming. This is what politicians in the US are deathly afraid of. So they go away from the middle, Go to the polls, you know, the, the, the opposite polls. That's it. Yes, sir. Subsidies are key for uh, American farmers, right? No. No? <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you have subsidies, you know, that, that's it. We hear that a lot. 
And the U.S. farm program, particularly for the big commodities, has gone away from subsidies to risk management. Now, you can call that a subsidy. You can call electricity a subsidy. But what the programs now focus on in, um, in that U.S. farm uh, in commodity agriculture, they wanted to get away from this. They knew that domestic subsidies were, were market distorted. They were making the U.S. agriculture uncompetitive. So they delinked subsidies from farm payments, substituted them with more robust risk management crop insurance tools. This is what modern farmers use now. So they, they'll buy crop insurance and they'll, you know, it's, it's partially subsidized by government payments to buy down the cost of that crop insurance, but it's all about risk management. They have to buy that. That's what they use. Now, you know, again, I'm talking major commodities. They have moved away from subsidies and, uh, and, and towards risk management. Yes, ma'am. Kind of follow up almost on that um, is about the corn industry. Right. And, and I'm interested in how the corn industry, it seems to have exploded in recent decades. Right. And almost become monocropping. I mean, it's just everything. And how is the corn industry driving our agricultural trade policies? And and are we are we in danger of? I don't know. It seems like it's in danger of not being sustainable. It's not a realistic type of diversity in yeah. cropping. I think you're seeing. You know, that's how they've been characterized for a long time. And that's vastly changing right now. The word in the corn industry right now is what's called sus sustainable intensification. And that means a whole variety of things. Um, yes, farmers know they need to, they're, they're not stupid. They, they take care of the land. They know crop rotation is very important. But again, the marketplace has not been rewarding them for that. The marketplace is, the only thing the marketplace has rewarded them for is yield improvement. And corn industry in particular has been very good at creating new demand for their products. And what I, what's always happened over time is they've always outproduced the market. The same thing's happening in the dairy industry here in New York State. They're always outproducing the market. And they're very concerned about that right now. And so they're trying to get together and say, well, what are we going to do about this? Um, yeah, corn and, and cotton and soybeans, yes, they're big players in the trade arena. But uh, I think you know, livestock interests, especially, product, especially pro uh, food product interests, are also bigger players now than they were 10 years ago in terms of the US agricultural policy and in terms of US trade policy. I think there's this discussion about going on about, well, what, what's best? And I always feel right now that this is a great time in the in history of mankind for US agriculture, because the marketplace has vastly diversified. And farmers need to have, pay attention to those signals that are hearing from around the world about, you know, customers want different things. They want them uh, in, in delivered in different ways. And the corn industry is, is aware of that, and they're changing to, to that. I think that we did a study about this in terms of, you know, what, what will world food demand look like in 2040? It's going to be vastly different than it is right now. Commodity agriculture is going to be a lesser slice of this pie, and it's going to be more specialized uh, value-added products. And the corn industry recognizes that. But again, they, they've been very successful at creating new markets for their product, which has driven a lot of investment and in research uh, in terms of helping them improve even more. So yeah, when you go to places like Iowa and Illinois, it's nothing like New York in terms of you see a soybean field or you see a corn field. Oh, there's a soybean field over there, there's a corn field over there. Yeah, it, it, it's concerning, but those farmers are just as concerned. But right now, what are they going to do? When you go out these places, you know, it's very hard for them to access the marketplace, you know, from where they are. So they, they, the production of corn, improving the production of corn, is key to their livelihood. So, yeah, yes, are you here? I'm, I'm from Ohio, uh -huh. and I know that um, manufacturing has been on the decline for yeah. 30, 40 years. Right. Yeah, it, it yeah. has been. Yeah. So it's no surprise that um, working class Americans in places like Pennsylvania, the Rust Belt, and, right. and Ohio where a lot of people have worked in manufacturing and mining are losing their jobs. Right. So the president and others often talk about retraining. So my question is, is there any research um, between the agricultural, you know, agricultural side and um, industry or manufacturers on how manufacturers or people in the mining industry can work together with the agricultural industries and producers? 
Because otherwise, you know, the, the problem is not going to get any better. You, yeah. We have a, a large number of middle class and working class Americans who have lost their jobs, and it's right. not poli politically okay to say, well, this is too bad. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. And this is the thing I was talking about earlier that retraining and getting into where there is growth in the economy, and there's very good growth in, in food products, specialty food products, uh, you know, new food products. That's, that's you know, luring a lot of technology to invest in that sort of action. You know, hopefully that'll create more jobs. There's a good example of it right over here in uh, Geneva, New York, where that happens, right? Uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, right now the thing that excites me a little bit is agriculture is popular once again as, as a sector. And it's, you know, bringing in talent, creating, attracting talent from other, other industries, one of the big problems focusing on this country is how do we you know, take industries that are, uh, you know, that are playing themselves out, like textiles, you know, we don't create any text, the only textiles we make here in the United States are sheets, you know, and curtains, things like that. How can we, you know, get those into different, this is the challenges for governments, county governments, state governments, national governments, retrain those workers into something that's productive. Again, this goes back to the fact that technology is displacing those jobs, not trade. And uh, th that, that's something that's very key, and that's that, what has to be there, there are, are programs in the, in the Farm Bill right now that um, fund, you know, techno, techno, techni, technology training, sorry. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we have to do. We have to do a better job of that. Yes, sir. As a young adult, we happen to go to uh, some of these uh, farms when we are traveling. Yeah. When you look at the landscape, you see how the whole farms are structured. You have the farmhouse, you have the farm, then you have the farm have all the equipment. Right. I want to know maybe the role that the state has played in the formative periods or during the establishment of those farms. The way they are structured and the, whether there was some state, uh, because if you look at it, there should be some kind of uh, arrangement and financial package behind. Yeah. But when you get back to Africa, it's, it's different. Yeah, that's a tough question. I wouldn't be in my, doing what I'm doing now we had those programs back where I was growing up. I grew up in a, you know, not too far, 100 miles from New York City. Uh, development was encroaching upon our farmland. There was no future in farming for me. My father said, don't even think about going into farming. There's no future in it. I think he might have been a little bit wrong because of the way agriculture has changed. But the problem is that, you know, the answer so far has been for farmers is to either get big or get small. The ones in the middle are, are either getting bigger or they're, or they're getting more niche oriented. And that's the exciting thing about agriculture, that at least these niche farmers are finding new markets. That's gonna drive things. Yes, and commodity markets are gonna drive things too. So they're, they're either doing one or the other. Uh, the states, you know, they, you know, they see this happening. One of the things a lot of people think are gonna happen right now, in the next few years, you're gonna see further consolidation in farming in the United States. Uh, so it's a big concern. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for the chance to come out to speak with you.